Awesome. Nothing gets people going like a bit of history, I always say. Uh, let's get let's get locked in here. All right. So the title of my talk is going to be a brief history of Bitcoin. Thank you all for attending. Let's see if this little clicker works. A little bit about me. Uh, yeah, Bitcoin historian on Twitter. If you follow me at Pete Rizzo, and I've been a journalist uh, covering Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies since 2013. And uh, I'll lead with a bit of an admission. Uh, I was agnostic about Bitcoin uh, and the larger cryptocurrency space until late 2017, which meant I was trying to be, uh, you know, uh, objective. I didn't have an opinion. I wasn't investing. I wasn't active in the market. So I was someone who was trying to make sense of information, communicate it, but I, to an extent, did not have an opinion, right? I wasn't active in the market. So what do I do today? Obviously, it's different. I believe in Bitcoin. Uh, a lot of my work, uh, you know, uh, this will be an attempt to synthesize it, but I conduct archival research, uh, which includes studying the major people and events in Bitcoin history, right? Bitcoin has been around now uh, for 15 years, and I believe that it's still very much a work in progress, uh, and that there are people today who have contributed to it meaningfully who are not Satoshi Nakamoto. So this presentation will attempt to synthesize my work on Bitcoin history and then also Bitcoin maximalism, which attempts to answer the question of, you know, why Bitcoin, not crypto? And uh, this is actually my first uh, public presentation. I'm usually the moderator, so uh, if I don't have anyone to bail me out on stage, uh, you know, come and get me. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it live. All right, so we'll start with the question, right? Why are we here? Uh, what is Bitcoin? So I really believe that there are three dominant sociologies in the wider world, uh, and they have three answers to this question. Obviously, everybody here, we believe in Bitcoin. All right, so what does that mean? It means Bitcoin is an invention, and we believe it's the full instantiation of that invention, right? Whatever Satoshi created, Satoshi created Bitcoin, and Bitcoin is it. All other crypto assets compete with Bitcoin by virtue of their existence. And what is Bitcoin's invention? Uh, it's either wholly captured by Satoshi's work, or it needs to be realized with modifications, right? We need to continue working on it. On the right here, we have everyone's favorite, the no-coiners, the fiat crowd. So what do the fiat crowd believe? Well, they believe that Bitcoin is not a real or meaningful invention, right? Ultimately, that's, that's their point, uh, that Bitcoin and all other crypto assets are bubbles, that they will go to zero. And the history shows uh, that government money is superior. It's better than private options. Some of these folks like blockchain and not Bitcoin, but, you know. Uh, over on the right, we got the crypto crowd. So last but not least, you know, they believe that Bitcoin's invention is either limited, incomplete, or obsolete. Ultimately, what they are saying to the market is that effort is needed to extend, improve, or replace Bitcoin. They're trying to do one of these three things, right? And they're saying that there are now crypto asset use cases that exist outside of Bitcoin that are not possible on Bitcoin. So what they're saying is that Bitcoin's invention was just the start of a series of inventions, and that is their claim. So, and we'll see how you can ask questions and you can see that these three sociologies exist. So what is Bitcoin maximalism? I think a lot of people here are calling themselves Bitcoin maximalists. And, and what purpose does it serve? Why are we using these words to describe ourselves? Well, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin maximalism is an ideology. And it, speaks to, it seeks to explain why Bitcoin is the best or only cryptocurrency. And uh, the argument of this work and this presentation is, is that it has evolved over time and that it ultimately has four major tenets. So I did some work earlier this year uh, with someone you may know, Mr. Jameson Lopp. He wrote a very extensive article about the history of Bitcoin maximalism. And, you know, we really spent a lot of time not trying to pin down, right? What are the reasons that someone should support Bitcoin and not other cryptocurrencies? What are the things that really differentiate Bitcoin at the end of the day? We came up with four things. Uh, you know, he, uh, he believes there's only three, but we'll save that argument for, for another time. So what are, the, what are the four tenets of Bitcoin maximalism? Why Bitcoin, not crypto? So these are the four things. I think one proof of work is winner takes all. Right? So the amount of equipment, that energy you need, right? the, the belief here is that when we're using energy uh, as a way to distribute Bitcoin, uh, the effects of this, the needs of this, right? we need to build these equipments, these computers, they'll eventually consolidate on one system. The second, and Jimmy just gave a great uh, speech about this, uh, is that money production must be ethical. We believe that the people who are creating money, should, there shouldn't be an imbalance of power. Right? There should be a known relationship to the money creators uh, that is ethical. Three, property rights must be absolute. At the end of the day, if you hold keys to a Bitcoin, no 
single person or group should be able to take that away from you or invalidate it. Uh, and lastly, uh, Bitcoin cannot be recreated. This is often called the immaculate conception theory. Essentially, it boils down to what Satoshi did was unique and it can't be replicated. There is no one in the world who can ever Im imbue the Bitcoin software, the properties that Satoshi did. All right, so let's get into the presentation. Um, really what we're gonna talk about is the Bitcoin only ideology over time. So the argument of this presentation is that Bitcoin maximalism is still developing, that it's evolved over time. It's been heavily shaped by us, the users of Bitcoin, the contributors, uh, and that it will continue to evolve or that it could continue to evolve and be shaped by unanswered questions about the software that we've yet to be resolved. All right, fun slide, the Bitcoin cycle. I think everybody here knows that we're believers that the Bitcoin number will go up uh, and that largely what we've seen over time is that Bitcoin has had, uh, you know, three monetization cycles, right? Whereas it hit some new all time high and then eventually, you know, there uh, is an event that happens and we, we hit new all time highs. So what are Bitcoin cycles? Sound money in the circular economy. This really means Bitcoin is programmatically scarce and it's getting more scarce over time. And this results in periodic, somewhat predictable price increases, right? Come for number, go up. You guys are here today. To date, there have been three cycles. Each cycle is kickstarted by a halving event. Each cycle peaks at a moment of euphoria, which is a condition of optimism. Ron Paul, it's happening. Uh, and then it goes down. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, and you can tell again that these three sociologies exist because you can ask the question of, okay, why have we seen three market cycles for Bitcoin? Well, in Bitcoin, our answer is that it's the monetary policy and programming, right? Satoshi imbued Bitcoin with a monetary policy that makes Bitcoin programmatically scarce over time. And because he did this, uh, we see periodic, uh, you know, price reactions to that. The crypto people will tell you that it's their productivity and ingenuity. They will tell you that the reason that we are getting cyclical increases in the cryptocurrency market is because, doggone it, they just have such good ideas. They're just doing such cool things. <laughs> uh, and the, lastly, the fiat people, they will tell you that it's all an investment mania, right? This, what we're doing here is just AMC. It's, we're, we're the Dogecoiners. You know, we're just another uh, uh, group like, uh, like that, the Game Stoppers. All right, so I'm gonna to try to convince you that you know we've had different cultures over time and the Bitcoin has evolved over time. So we're gonna take the Bitcoin time machine. We're gonna get in the DeLorean. We're gonna go back through and do uh, the brief history. So we're gonna go all the way back to 2011, 2014. We've got some, I want you to get in the mood here. We've got a woman up here on the left. She's riding a Segway, the future of transportation. You wouldn't be walking anymore. Uh, underneath her, we've got uh, Mr. Mark Zuckerberg. He's really happy. He just had his IPO. There's a movie coming out about him. The social network he's happy up there we've got a mentally cognitive joe biden with a very uh you know a barack obama who looks you know happy and, and young still we've got one of the first iphones points if you know in the top right that's uh, the highest paid tv actor of the time mr charlie sheen he's drinking tiger blood out of that uh, out of that can and then we got sai gangnam style one of the first viral videos so all right bitcoin cycle one the culture how many people here got into bitcoin from 2011 and 2014 Okay, a few hands. I'm, I'm from this cycle. So a few images. These were all very mainstream, very popular images of the time. Uh, we'll just start front and center. The Silk Road, dark markets, anonymous currency, buying drugs with the Silk Road. Uh, that was a big, big narrative. To the left, we got, uh, this was a sign that was actually held up at a college football game. Somebody uh, raised a Bitcoin QR code. They received 25 Bitcoin for that. And that was a big news story at the time. Below. We have a billboard, and this was credited with really orange pilling a lot of Silicon Valley at the time. Uh, this is a honey badger, and uh, this was paid for by Mr. Roger Ver. It says the honey badger of money. And again, this just shows the culture of the time. It was nerd money. It was, it was, Bitcoin was very much a thing of the internet. To the right, we have the Bitcoin faucet. Bitcoin users were giving away Bitcoin for free. They wanted adoption so badly, they were giving away Bitcoin. You could go to this website and you would actually receive five Bitcoin just for answering a CAPTCHA and putting in a Bitcoin address. And over the right, we have a conference that looks very much like this, Bitcoin 2013. And you can see the title, The Future of Payments. Very bonus points if you know the guy in the bottom right. That's Mr. Eric Lombroso, a, a great contributor to Bitcoin who we'd love to see around here more. But what were the major events in cycle one? Bitcoin becomes money. It achieves a non-zero value. Satoshi leaves and he leaves a developer in charge named Gavin Andreessen who starts a Bitcoin foundation, which is a non-profit organization that managed Bitcoin development. The first halving happens without issue. The first Bitcoin startups get funded. Merchant adoption really propels Bitcoin's growth and payments is the narrative. And the first altcoins largely emerge and fail. 
So we see people come to Bitcoin and, and try to improve it. Here's a typical headline of the time, TechCrunch, that was very much the vibe. You know, unfazed by Bitcoin's wild swings and mysterious origins, Silicon Valley VCs place their bets, right? Bitcoin was a Silicon Valley thing. So the narratives, instant payments. Bitcoin is cheaper than credit cards. Credit cards charge fees. Bitcoin is free and instant, no chargebacks. Bitcoin allows online payments without fraud. Merchants would adopt it. Micropayments, you could do things on the internet like send small payments. Free trade, we can now trade anything drugs, uh, paraphernalia, whatever might be illegal. And of course, that there was no bailouts or central bank. Uh, the 08 crisis was still fresh and there was a belief that a new financial system might be needed. What are the politics looks like? So Bitcoin actually ended up being a savvy way for Democrats to, single, to signal their popularity in Silicon Valley. So you know the guy on the left, that's Gavin Newsom, current ga uh, governor of California. That's Jared Polis. Uh, he's the governor of Colorado, both still current politicians. They took Bitcoin. They were popularly associated with at the time. So Bitcoin maximalism really gets its roots at this time, right? So Bitcoin needed to recruit and retain developers. It had to discourage, you know, other qualified coders from starting projects. There simply weren't that many developers working on Bitcoin. It was possible that you could have gotten 10 people together and started a competing project. There would have been more developers there. Some people experimented with all coins, but generally this was encouraged because we didn't want uh, you know, them to lose focus on what we were building on Bitcoin, right? We encouraged competing blockchains. So cycle one really ends with a couple conclusions. One is that proof of work is winner takes all, right? Because proof of work is how, and using energy to distribute cryptocurrency is the only way we can do it fairly. Uh, but again, it has these attributes. We need hardware specialization. We need these large data centers. There was a belief that Bitcoin had achieved the greatest network effect. And the second one would be that money production must be ethical, right? So as these other cryptocurrencies were starting, they had to figure out how do we distribute the coins without energy? And the answer is they did it in pre-mines, which is they allocated coins to themselves. They tried to build a market around Bitcoin. Uh, and from this, you know, we learned that all coins, you know, they'll never be as decentralized as Bitcoin. All right, next stop on the time machine. 2014 to 2018, we got some fidget spinners up in the top left. We've got some more colorful iPhones. Uh, we've got the Angry Birds, typical of the mobile app era, Big Phenom, they had their own movie. We've got a BuzzFeed article about BuzzFeed articles, because that was the internet at the time. <laughs> and then uh, top right, we've got uh, Hillary Clinton, she ran for president. So Bitcoin cycle two, what does the culture look like? Well, in the top left, we have the inventor of the credit default swap. She came into town and she had a blockchain startup. She raised a bunch of money from banks to try to subvert Bitcoin. Below her, we've got a photo of a conference called Scaling Bitcoin. There was actually 90% of the hash power on a single stage. There was six, six people on a single stage, and they represented 90% of the mining power in Bitcoin. Real bonus points if you uh, know the individuals there in the top. That's John Seth and DeRose, the first Bitcoin podcast, Bitcoin Uncensored. That little ant being a slab stabbed to death. Ant bleed. I don't know if I have time to expand, explain that one, but essentially it's a time of conspiracy theories. Everyone was wondering who was subverting Bitcoin, who was out to stop us. So what were the major events? Gavin Andreessen is deposed as lead developer amid the fork wars. There are fierce technical battles globally as miners and developers debate the future of Bitcoin. Mining consolidates in China, giving rise to a powerful regional cartel that really exerts on Bitcoin, blocking some of the technical proposals. Merchant adoption stalls. Many Bitcoin companies begin working with the banks. They just, you know, maybe Bitcoin isn't working. We have Ethereum and the ICO boom, and there's the rebrand of Bitcoin to crypto. And the price falls and later regains record highs, really at a time of great uncertainty. I'm traveling around the world to, country, uh, co to conferences like this, and there's grown men fighting in rooms about the future of Bitcoin. The politics, political polarization really spills into Bitcoin with the Hillary Trump era. We see two factions, the Bitcoin cashers, they want Bitcoin to be for payments, and then the UASF crowd, they want Bitcoin to have smaller blocks. I'm sure you've heard a little bit about this war. Here's what the headlines look like. Here's the New York Times, a Bitcoin believer's crisis of faith. Uh, on the right, we have Gavin Andreessen. He's forking Bitcoin, the lead developer actively forking Bitcoin. This was the turmoil and strife of the time. What are the narratives? Well, the developers were trying to make altcoins obsolete. There was a belief that Bitcoin could do anything these crypto networks could do on sidechains, lightning, and other innovations. And we were going to outcompete them. There was a belief that Bitcoin was the most secure blockchain. We didn't need these private blockchains because Bitcoin had more security. Bitcoin must scale. It was a dominant focus of the culture, was that technical debates. If you didn't have a white paper, you wouldn't have been on the stage. That was the technical level of the conversation. 
Uh, and last, you know, there was this idea that Bitcoin was just part of a wider asset class, right? You bought Bitcoin to get exposure to these other things, even these other forks. Bitcoin may fork hundreds of times and you may get exposure to that. And also, you know, Bitcoin was one of the only things you could buy to even participate in these ICOs, right? You actually had to buy Bitcoin to buy some of these other crypto assets. So cycle two ends with one very important, very complex conclusion. And I would argue to the extent that most people have a, a individual view on, on Bitcoin, you know, it is from this time period. And it's the property rights must be absolute. Hard forks are unacceptable. And no case can a Bitcoin user be forced to call a specific software instance Bitcoin. You get to decide what Bitcoin base is based on the software you run. Organized governance is unacceptable. Bitcoin cannot be in a democracy. We cannot have a formal governance. It cannot be subject to voting. And that minority rights must be protected in all cases. Bitcoin cannot function in a way uh, or at all as a, uh, you know, as a sound money if there is some majority that can rescind your rights to your Bitcoin. This is what happens in hard forks on Ethereum and other things like that. The majority of the people get together and they say this software is now Ethereum. Your keys, if you're running the own chain, there are no longer exists. And so in Bitcoin, we believe that par property rights must be absolute. 2019 to 2022. This might be a little bit more painful, a little bit more fresh. We've got a very angry Greta Thornburg. We've got a very stern Dr. Fauci. We've got a bunch of people spraying some subway station, uh, presumably in China. And then we've got the vaccine. So what does that do to the culture? What does Bitcoin look like? Have fun staying poor. I hope we're have, having fun staying poor now, but that was the that was the that was the meme of the time. We've got a bunch of laser eyes. We've got podcasts. We've got Jack Dorsey, of course, has you know put his assets and his company to the Bitcoin cause, for which we're very thankful. We've got the stock to flow model, uh, which promised that we could predict the Bitcoin price and that it would go up predictably. And we've got a very happy safe in a moose there. He's got a big big ass stake, and he's very very happy about that. Who who doesn't love that? What were the major events? Bitcoin emerges as the winner of the fork wars. The market declares Bitcoin the winner. Sailor Jack and uh, you know all these public figures, they embrace BTC. Self-custody improves. There's a rise in Bitcoin as freedom money. You can hold your keys. We have the Canadian truckers. The Bitcoin standard is published to acclaim, leading to a new renewed focus on economics. Bitcoin's a store of value. The focus of the community is on modeling Bitcoin's price appreciations. We're sure it's gonna go up. We just need to figure out how and to what price. Bitcoin upgrades again with Taproot, though the process is once again controversial and convoluted. And Bitcoin and crypto separate into two communities. There's a big and there. There is now Bitcoin and crypto. They're separate movements. The politics. We've got the laser-eyed politicians. We've got Mr. Ted Cruz. We've got Cynthia Lemus. Bitcoin becomes a savvy way for, you know, the political right to signal dissatisfaction with government overreach. Headlines I'm sure you've seen, Bitcoin hits record as inflation drumbeat grows louder. These were the faces who were talking about Bitcoin. What were the narratives? Bitcoin is an inflation insurance. Bitcoin is freedom. Nation states are going to adopt it to get out of the US-led system. Uh, Bitcoin and energy. Bitcoin is going to re-incentivize renewable energy and reinvigorate it. And then Bitcoin, not crypto. Bitcoin is fundamentally different from other crypto assets. It's the true invention. Anything else is obsolete or a scam. So what did we learn from that process? Uh, I would argue cycle three was really about reinforcing and scaling one big belief, which I would argue the, you know, we got across the mainstream media, Bitcoin and crypto. Bitcoin won't repeat. There was immaculate conception. Bitcoin is different than the 10,000 other cryptos because Satoshi gave it special properties that cannot be recreated or replicated. There's a leaderless community. There's a fair supply. There's predictable distribution and there's no one in charge. Bitcoin is not only an invention, but is moral, just, and perhaps inevitable. All right, so I'm not gonna leave you hanging here because there's another fourth thing on the slide over here, which is an unfinished price chart. So we got 2022 to 2025, what's coming up? I'm gonna get out the Bitcoin crystal ball. We've got Suraman there, he's thinking. So what I hope to present here is this argument that Bitcoin culture is cyclical. Uh, the Bitcoin culture and narrative has changed over time as we, the users, have tried to answer questions about the software. I hope that I've been able to show that Bitcoin has been championed at different times for different reasons and that some of these ideas are still true and some of them aren't, right? And we are still attempting to use Bitcoin for payments. That's why people use Lightning and that was something that the culture in 2013 was trying to achieve. Each cycle brings some new insights to our understanding, but it also reinforces some misconceptions, right? There are things we get wrong. There are things that we simply don't know about Bitcoin because it's an evolving system. 
There's also a danger in these cultural transitions because new users lack the context to understand them. They, they believe that Bitcoin, as is presented to them, is how it always was and it was never anything different. And these users are actually the most likely to be stuck in prior narratives. So I think a lot of people here have, you know, may look down on the folks who went over to the Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin SV camps. And I would say to you, well, they sat at conferences like this. They, they loved Bitcoin as well. They bought Bitcoin with the same hopes that you do. And now they are not here. They're a different group. Uh, and part of that was they were not able to change their mental impression of what Bitcoin was. They were told Bitcoin was a certain thing and they were unable to ever accept that it could be something else. And there may be a risk that the same pattern repeats, I can't say, uh, but it has happened. So Bitcoin maximalism reviewed. Bitcoin maximalism is an ideology. It seeks to explain why Bitcoin is the full extent of Satoshi's invention. We've covered that, and I've covered these four tenants. Though my numbers are horrible. I don't know why they're all off. Uh, what would another thing look like? This, originally, this was a five. I'm not sure what happened here. But <laughs> if there was five, what would a fifth tenant of Bitcoin maximalism look like? So I'm going to show some images here that might be a little bit taboo. Please save your gasps. All the way on the left, we have taproot assets. This is a proposal by the Lightning developers to form a network on which arbitrary assets, such as stable coins and other things, could live on the Bitcoin network. In the middle, we have the dreaded Taproot Wizard. Uh, this is a uh, Bitcoin ordinal. This is a image that is forever enshrined on the blockchain. If you're running a node, uh, you have a copy of this image. Uh, it is distributed all across the network. And to the right, we have drive chains. Uh, this is a very controversial, complex proposal for changing Bitcoin, such as the image implies that there could be many cryptocurrencies that operate and run on top of it. We don't need this crypto apparatus. It can be reimagined on Bitcoin. I think these three things are really trying to get at more fundamental questions. And as much as we have current strife over these uh, proposals, I think that they're useful uh, in hinting at we as a culture are still trying to figure out. So one of these things here, if you look at this chart, one is the Bitcoin issuance schedule. Bitcoin is being issued over time, and eventually we won't issue any more Bitcoin. The subsidy will go to zero. And to the right, we have a full mempool. I think a lot of people here might have paid high fees for transactions, uh, knowing what it's like to now get in the mempool at certain times when there's congestion, maybe like we haven't seen before. And so I think the question here is what guarantees Bitcoin security in perpetuity? We know that the subsidy is eventually going to zero. So there's this debate around the, quote, security model of Bitcoin. And I would argue there's th two theories about Bitcoin security in the future, and both of which are pretty poorly understood. Uh, the first is uh, this idea, uh, you know, I think Paul Stortz, the big evangelist for this, that we need to proactively increase the amount of Bitcoin fees that are being paid to replace the subsidy, and that in the future, the future will be a reality of full blocks. Bitcoin blocks will always be full. They need to be full because miners need to be being paid enough to defend the network from attack. The second one is this theory called the cost of counter censorship. This has been put forward by people like Pierre Richard and it's, it has a vocal defenders. And essentially their argument is, no, it is you, the user, and your ability to always pay more than the cost of the censorship that secures Bitcoin. That your ability to pay fees, the ability for any miner in the world to join the network and accept that fee and approve your transaction, that is the security. We do not need to worry about full Bitcoin blocks. We do not need to worry about the subsidy. Bitcoin will always be secure, even in environments with low fees. And that is a current debate. Next open question, I would argue, is, is there a future for Bitcoin assets? Tokens, NFTs, etc. that have always existed on Bitcoin, going back to 2013, 2014. And Bitcoins can be used to represent anything. I mean, even if you see this in the arguments of the eCash and stable coins, Bitcoin is just a string of numbers. And it's theoretically possible for these things to exist. But our culture views all these assets as competing monies or scams. I would argue that, you know, the ethics of money production has now applied to any and all assets that could possibly exist on Bitcoin. And I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, and I think the question about Bitcoin assets is, can they play a useful role in the Bitcoin economy? Will they ever live here? What are they? And I think that's something we still need to ask ourselves and figure out. Final question that I think is at the root of a lot of this debate is what type of user do we want to acquire? So here we have a man in a suit. He's looking at pie charts. I, I'm pretty sure that's what institutional investors do. They just sit in glass offices and they look at pie charts. Uh, and to the right, we have a script kitty gamer. I'm assuming that he's aping into some NFT drop. He's got a, he's got a Red Bull there that he's drinking. 
So institutional investors have more capital, right? But they also have regulatory and cultural barriers. They have to appease regulators. And look, a lot of them are, they're old. There is an older demographic, right? Do you really believe that, um, you know, the golden generations uh, will risk their capital uh, on Bitcoin? The crypto degen, I mean, he's more familiar with cryptocurrency. He uses keys, he's whole, he may have a wallet, uh, you know, but he wants to speculate or he or she, and you know, he may be uninterested in boring old Bitcoin unless you know, he can get his, his JPEG. So the question I think is, you know, is one of these paths to adoption better? Or to an extent, can they both coexist? You know, is there, a, is there a way for different groups within Bitcoin to target both these users? Can they both be accommodated? Uh, and I think that's the last lingering question. So I'll leave you with that. This has been my presentation. Um, Pete Rizzo, you can find me on Twitter at Pete underscore Rizzo. Every day you'll get a nice little history nugget. And I think we're going to go to questions uh, if we got any. Thank you. <laughs> questions? I don't know how the questions work. Do I call on people? Does somebody go to them? Okay, great. Yeah, just pick somebody. I don't know. I can't see any. There's blaring lights. What altcoin do I own the most? I do not own any altcoins. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, thank you. I guess. Thank you. Well, I guess uh, the U.S. dollar. Maybe that's a good answer. Yeah. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to disappoint you that I, I still have dollars. They seem useful, I guess, for for some things. Hi, Pete. Um, Where am I looking? Sorry, I can't really. Right here. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Probably see my silhouette. Yeah. Ordinals, good or bad? What, it, other than, I guess they're meant to replace NFTs on Ethereum, but what is what is the use of them? What is there a business application? Is there, is there a big business application for something like an ordinal? For an ordinal, yeah. Well, you know, on a technical level, what the ordinal is doing is that it's just storing data on the blockchain. So I'll give you an example. Um, you know, let's just say you had to get some sort of uh, image file or there was some file you wanted to distribute, but you were worried about it not being available in perpetuity. Let's say you live in a country uh, where there's an authoritative regime and you wanted to, you know, uh, put some plans for something in, in some place where, you know, you could always rely on it being accessible on the internet. Well, you know, Bitcoin is a distributed database and that is, has constant uptime, right? There are thousands of nodes. So you would be able to retrieve that file. So, you know, I can't comment on the value of NFTs. Obviously my view on that hasn't changed. I think most of those will trend to zero over time, but you know, the application of embedding data into the blockchain in an immutable fashion where such that it might be only useful to that single individual could be valuable. So I, I think the answer is we don't know. We got another one here. Hey, where, Pete, where thanks oh. for the presentation. That was great. Um, what sources are you looking for and what sources are you archiving? And Oh, good question. Yeah, so one of the interesting things about Bitcoin as opposed to other technologies, if you think about like, you know, the airplane or the television or something, is we just have such a great body of material uh, about the early days of Bitcoin. So there were tons of forums and uh, internet channels where, you know, we don't have a transcript of what happened when the US Constitution was founded, right? When they wrote it, we don't know what, you know, John Jay said at, you know, lunchtime that convinced, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> George Washington to write something else. With Bitcoin, you know, we really do have through the eras, there are, you know, exhaustive channels where people were talking 24 seven, having constant debates, uh, talking about certain attributes of Bitcoin. And we can go back and we can look at these conversations and see how they've occurred in real time and see, okay, where does this idea come from? Who's the first individual that proposed it? How did he propose it? What was the reaction? Uh, and, and how did that uh, specifically develop? So there are certain ideas you may be familiar with like Bitcoin toxicity, Right, this idea that we need to defend Bitcoin uh, at all costs, or that you know no one can tell me how to run uh, run Bitcoin. You know that comes from a single individual. That that comes from someone who proposed, uh, you know, that as a way uh, to think about Bitcoin. And we can go back and we can read his posts, and, and we can see how he evangelized for that idea, and see how it spread in the culture. Uh, but ultimately, I think that's valuable because uh, we can go back and we can trace the genesis. In this case, this was an individual who. Uh, you know, he was living in uh, Romania, right? This is a country that had been devastated both by communism and by democracy, where all these things had failed. And he was one of the first users to come to Bitcoin from a non-Western perspective and really see the failure of the political apparatus. And, you know, he was horrified that the idea that politics might come to Bitcoin. And so, 
you know, I believe his perspective is really useful. And I think to the extent that it helps us understand Bitcoin today, uh, you know, my hope is to eventually present some of this work. So I think we might have time for one more in a minute. Anybody? All right. You can find me online, Pete Rizzo. I uh, appreciate you all paying attention and uh, keep learning about Bitcoin. Grandpa. Why do you have so much Bitcoin? Well, it all started in the year 2023 when I attended a conference called BitBlock Boom. What's BitBlock Boom, Grandpa? It was a conference where people talked about Bitcoin. This was way back when we used something called the US dollar for money. What? Bitcoin wasn't always the world's money? If it weren't for great speakers at BitBlock Boom like Jimmy Song, Adam Curry, and Preston Pish, we'd all be living in pods and eating bugs. Instead, I was able to avoid fiat enslavement and secure generational wealth. F***ing legend. Be the legend your grandchildren deserve. Experience the best Bitcoin conference out there and join the Bitcoin revolution. BitBlock Boom, the only conference for true Bitcoin maximalists. Book your tickets today at bitblockboom.com and use the code BBB1 for a special discount.